Welcome to Sex Care is Self Care, a conversation on women's sexual health brought to you by the Patty Brisbane Foundation for Women's Sexual Health. I'm your host, Patty Brisbane. Today we're talking about vulvodynia and the impact on women's well being. If you or someone you know is dealing with chronic vaginal pain, this podcast will provide insight about the condition and steps you need to take to improve it. I'm joined today by Dr. Michael Critchman and Dr. Andrew London. Dr. Critchman and Dr. London, could you please introduce yourselves and tell our listeners exactly what you do on a daily basis? Great, Patty. Well, it's wonderful to be here. I am Dr. Michael Critchman. I'm a sexual medicine gynecologist. I have uh, three clinical practices at the university. I see cancer survivors. I see women who have chronic uh, pelvic pain, complex gynecological issues. So the issue of vulvodynia certainly is prevalent in my clinical practice. I'm very often a tertiary referral where people will send those patients for um, really detailed management. They've been suffering for quite some time. In addition, I'm really excited, uh, and you know, it's an honor to serve on the Medical Advisory Board for the Patty Brisbane Foundation. I'm the chair. We're doing amazing work, as everybody knows. We uh, give out grants that are really founded in clinical and scientific research. We have elevated the standard of female sexual health and research. And uh, we're really changing the lives of women and empowering women to get knowledge and become educated. So I'm really excited um, that Dr. London has agreed so graciously to take a little break from his magic. He's a budding magician, but he is an a, even better gynecologist. So very excited to have him here uh, to talk with us about this very important condition. Hi, I'm Andy London. I'm from Baltimore. I'm an assistant professor at Johns Hopkins. I'm a gynecologist, uh, recovering obstetrician, and my practice is a lot on menopause as well as sexual health for women. And there aren't many people in Baltimore doing it, so I've gotten a lot of referrals over the years to try and change two people's lives at once. That's amazing, and we're grateful that you're out there doing just that. Dr. London, can you give our listeners an overview of what is vulvodynia and the possible symptoms of this condition? Well, unfortunately, vulvodynia is pain of the vulva. It's the outside area of the vagina, the entrance, and it can be very, very painful and very distressing to women. Uh, their sexual life goes down. They, they are constantly in pain. They've seen many doctors. It's actually called allodynia, which is pain in, in an area which you wouldn't normally expect pain in. Uh, an example might be sunburn. You touch your skin, it hurts, and it normally shouldn't, or hot water or even cold water can, can touch it. But that's what allodynia is, and it can be generalized all over the vulva. It can be uh, just right at one spot and it's very very hard to diagnose because so many other things play into this uh, there can be infections and we'll get into some of the factors that go into the development of this but women are very distressed they've usually seen several doctors about this and it's sometimes a very very difficult diagnosis to make and are, and are treated with numerous medications and sometimes unfortunately even they get to surgery uh, before an, an actual diagnosis is made. So let's talk about this. Let's talk about the risk factors for developing vulvodynia. What is it? Well there's so many. Uh, it can start with inflammation or infection. If someone has a vaginal infection it can irritate the the skin area on the outside. They can actually have um, burning and itching, and they do not want to be touched there. Uh, it can be very, very distressing. There's also a, a what's called a neurogenic factor that nerves can actually uh, grow into that area. They don't tend to branch, but they can be very sensitive in that area. Uh, there's a, a cell called a mast cell that has actually been shown to proliferate and cause the pain. There's just so much that goes into this. And as I said, very difficult to diagnose. Yeah, and, and Andy, I think it's really important to recognize that 
we know that there are certainly some conditions that may be associated with it, right? So the chronic yeast infection that's treated and treated and treated and treated and treated and treated some more with the same kind of medication, uh, we know that that may increase your risk for developing this. Even also, you know, early start young, um, young women who are put on uh, low dose oral contraceptive pills may be at risk as well. And I mean, the results are and statistics are staggering. 25% of all young women on birth control pills may have experienced some sexual pain uh, condition, whether it's vulvodynia or vaginal dryness or what have you. So again, sometimes we have to be, you know, the sexual medicine detective and we have to kind of see where the pain is located and what are the risk factors. But very often there's no risk factors uh, as well. Okay, let me ask this. I know that it, it's been it, it's been out there that it takes many women at least seven different doctors before she even gets a diagnosis. Um, what it, what do you, what does she do? What what should be done? Well, this? you know, I think it's really important. We talked earlier with um, Nurse Barb, and we talked about that. You know, we have two two ears and one mouth, and we should listen twice as much as we speak. And very often, clinicians are not listening to patients. And uh, unfortunately, when sometimes when you're looking at the tissue, you don't really see anything, and everything looks completely normal. So clinicians may make the assumption that you know it's all in her head; it's not really happening. Um, this is a condition that you really need to go to a specialist who's well-versed in it, who knows how to do the specified tests. It's very rather easy to diagnose if you do what's called a Q-tip test, where you actually are touching the certain areas in the opening of the vagina and, and you're touching the lips. You will basically, women will jump off the table because you're pinpointing the pain. If you haven't been taught this or you don't are, are not aware of clinical suspicion of this condition, you can certainly have a lot of problems in terms of diagnosis. So again, um, I think finding the right clinician, uh, very important. And I know you and I always agree that if your clinician is not listening to you mm -hmm. uh, and you're not empowered, it's okay to fire your clinician. It's always okay to get a second opinion for your clinician as well. Exactly. Uh, Dr. London, once a woman has been diagnosed with vulvodynia, how is it typically treated? Well, for, before I get right into treatment, uh, it's very, very important to listen to exactly what the patient has told you. It's set a story for them, and they'll tell you what's wrong with them in many cases. And then we start to do the diagnosing, and you actually map the area with the Q-tip test, as Dr. Critchman was talking about, and check if it's one area or provoked by a touch, or if it's just all the time. Uh, certain things like bicycle riding has, has created this for some women, unfortunately. They wear the wrong shorts, uh, the, the seat isn't adjusted right, and it, it creates a chronic irritation for them. So once we have it, if we've ruled out all of the other things, the chronic yeast infections that Dr. Critchman talked about, and other infections, and topical, uh, ointments and creams and things that can create issues for them. Uh, and we set this, the, the setting, we can try and go into the treatments and the treatments can be anywhere from nothing and it will go away in a, a reasonable percent of, of women, but not fast. It takes a while, it can be three to four months before you start to see an improvement. The other things that have been used, uh, they've used things like um, nortriptyline and some of the uh, antidepressants that have, have been helped, and some of the neuroactive drugs have been tried as well. Then even Botox was used. But hygiene has to be talked over with, are you uh, douching? Are you putting lots of sprays and things you bought at the drugstore down there? Um, what's what's ca causing it to get worse? Uh, what are you doing? What makes it better? Because a lot of times they'll say, I've tried this, I've tried that. Uh, keeping things away from it that irritate it are going to be really, really important. 
You know, and it's very important that, you know, I, what I typically will use, Andy, is I use a lot of um, hormones, estrogen and testosterone, but, but it's important to compound those in really hypoallergenic bases because sometimes the conventional medicines, they're mixed with um, ingredients that can be irritating and they could be, it could be like pouring kerosene on an open fire. So again, you want to know what you're putting, where you're putting it. Um, but again, using estrogen and testosterone cream compounded sometimes is very, very helpful. Some of the oral medications like in the class of antidepressants or anti-nerve medicines as well. I also wanted to mention, Patty, that very often women will have this anticipatory anxiety. They know it's going to hurt when anything touches that, whether it's a finger, a self-stimulator, a penis, or what have you. So they almost have this reflex tightening and clenching of their muscles. So it's not uncommon to have the vulvodynia with muscle spasm inside the vagina in anticipation of penetration. So again, a comprehensive evaluation putting things into the vagina, like maybe you need muscle relaxants, maybe you need pelvic floor physical therapy as well as a combined treatment. So it's it's not just a simple pill and we're done. There are, it's a complicated, intricate um, system of issues that are developing as a result of this pain syndrome. And Dr. Critchman is very right. It, it, sometimes it's multiple uh, disciplines don't overlook the physical therapist. That has been very, very helpful. Uh, there have been some medications that they use that, that decrease the spasm. But how you examine the patient can be very, very important. If you've used the Q-tip and it's, it's determined that that is point on the right, stay on the left, go higher, use a pediatric instrument to examine them. Um, let them relax or even have them put the instrument in themselves. And I've had pretty good success with them doing that part and then I can uh, examine them because they're relaxed because they're doing it. And that's been helpful. Now you did speak earlier about birth control. Does birth control play a part in this? Angie, do you want to feel that one? It can, it absolutely can. And, and a lot of women, I, I think Dr. Critchman said it earlier, and a reasonable percentage of women on birth control pills can experience pelvic pain at some point during the, the pills. Sometimes switching the pills can help, sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes it's, you have to discontinue them as well. But again, remember that sometimes a birth control pill, the, the damage is done, and it could be the, the predisposition to this condition. This is a chronic condition. Sometimes it waxes and wanes. It can go away, then it can come back. It may go away for several years and then come back for several years. So again, um, and very often it's a diagnosis of exclusion. You want to make sure there's no infections, there's no dermatological issues, there's no underlying malignancy. So this is really an intricate um, condition of sexual pain syndromes that really warrants somebody who is very well versed. And I know Andy and I both have uh, referrals from community gynecologists. Not everybody is aware of this. Not everybody wants to treat these patients. They're rather complicated. They have multiple visits. They involve multiple treatment paradigms. We talked about physical therapy. Sometimes they involve pain management. Sometimes they're using vaginal dilators. I know you guys have a great set at Pure Romance, and we use those as well. Um, that's because they become so conditioned that the, the you know the pelvic area is so angry and hostile. Um, using the the vaginal dilators helps them recondition to know that the vagina is not a terrible place to to be and what have you. So again, a, a little more detailed in terms of the treatment paradigm. When it comes to intimacy, how, what do you tell this woman? You know, what are some of the steps, the measures that can be taken for her to, you know, be more comfortable in that situation with her significant other? So I think, you know, for the extreme, I tell them that intimacy is a, is a spectrum, right? So for some women, they are so concerned about the pain and it we're talking excruciating pain i say rate your pain at 10 at uh, 10 is the worst they come in and they say it's 17. um so that the the 
anything that's involving the vagina really is really off limits at this point until they, we can get their pain under control. But there is outer course, there's sexual pleasure, there's touching, there's kissing, there's the breasts are very sensual. And I want to really encourage maintaining intimacy. Um, and how that is very important. So there's physical intimacy, being in the same place, same time, holding hands, erotic massage, emotional intimacy, sharing and caring and talking about this this big issue. Then sensual intimacy, sometimes just kissing and hugging and being in the shower together, or um, you know, oral sex is okay, and manual stimulation may be okay. So again, this is a gradual reclaiming of sexual intimacy. And again, that's our ultimate goal. But again, I think we need to get the pain under control and then very often recondition the woman to realize very often she's using dilators by herself. Maybe she's self-stimulating. Maybe she realizes that this is you know, a, a better place that's not so angry and hostile and so painful that that's very important as well. So um, setting realistic expectations, setting a timeline, I think is very important and listening to your patient's needs. If the timeline is so important that, that um, you're not, it just didn't occur overnight, you're not going to get rid of it overnight. And my goal is for them to realize they don't have to have pain. So w w by using dilators on their own, they find out what areas hurt and what don't, and they go, oh, well, maybe that steroid ointment or cream that I'm using has helped, or the estrogen testosterone has helped. And, oh, that doesn't hurt. Well, maybe I can try other things, whether it's oral sex, whether it's, it's penetrative sex, uh, whatever can work for them, and they will tell you what works for them. Dr. London, can you discuss with the listeners the importance of having the right health care team, and what kind of information should you provide for your provider when you're going to see them? I mean, what should you have prepared? Well, a lot of times these people have come come in because they've been frustrated and they've been treated 14 times for their yeast infection or whatever and they're not getting better they're totally frustrated they haven't been counseled so they come in fairly fresh and there are lots of organizations um, there's the international study for vulvar diseases uh, that have have uh, has a website where you can find specialists all over the country so they can go to them. But someone who is comfortable with treating this, and sometimes it does need a referral, but it is a biologic problem. It is not in their heads. And that, that's, you know, they, they've been told that. They go, oh, we don't see anything. Everything's good. Uh, but, it, you know, it, just relax. Have a drink. It'll be fine. And no, yeah. that's not or, the answer. Or, you, or you're, you're, it's all in your head. You must be depressed. You must be anxious. Exactly. You must be overwhelmed. And again, I think it's very important, you know, as you develop your healthcare team, uh, Patty and I are very big advocates of writing things down, writing your questions. Come prepared. Uh, and if your clinician is not listening, um, it's okay to get a second opinion, a third opinion, and it certainly is okay to fire your clinician. Uh, I think that's really important that women need to be empowered about taking back control over their bodies, about how they feel, uh, how sexuality is such a vital component to the overall experience of the human life. And again, if their needs are not being met, there are certainly clinicians available. And now with the advent and uh, acceptance of telehealth, um, the network is really much larger than it's ever been before in terms of getting the right help for the right condition. Yeah, I, you know, I think it's so important to have that right health care provider and somebody who is going, because there are no questions that are stupid. And if he makes you or she makes you feel that way, you do need to move on because you have that right. Right. And we have one of those, I mean, I'll give the Patty Brisbane Foundation a, a little bit of a plug here because we have a, a brochure that we've developed together, you and I, in terms of building your healthcare team. And that is one of the most popular downloads that we have from the site. And people that are not only affiliated with the organization come in and do that. And I think that's so important is to really build your team. And we talked about pain management. We talked about... Um, 
physical therapy. And it's okay to get a second opinion. And it's okay to be empowered to build the team that will listen to you as your needs evolve. And this concept of precision medicine is where we are with, you know, every woman's experience of vulvodynia and pain is different. Mm -hmm. So should her treatment paradigm be different. You know, you is there a place that if you're newly diagnosed that you can go and be able to have some helpful hints to give to your partner? Because if some women are really afraid, especially in a heterosexual relationship, of going home and talking to their partner and saying, here, we're gonna have to try some different things right now because I'm in pain. And so is there a place that both of them can um, learn about this together? So I'll jump in first and then ask Andy his, his thoughts. But I really have a different approach to that. I think that you need to bring the partner in to the visit because sometimes it's not a safe place for a woman to confront and talk to the partner about what is actually going on. But when they hear it from the clinician as a third party who's neutral, I think that makes a very big difference. And when it's ascribed to them and say, look, this is what's going on. This is not in her head. This is a physiological, biological phenomena. We're going to get to where we need to be. And these are the steps that we need to approach. I think that's very different. But there are resources available, the National Vovodinia Association, the International Society uh, for sexual medicine. There's, uh, you know, the American College of OBGYN. There's, as uh, Dr. London alluded to, the International Society for Vulvar Disease. I mean, there's a lot of organizations that have resources and find a clinician, find a provider. But I think the most important concept to remember is have the woman be empowered to bring her partner in with her. Dr. London? It's couples therapy. That is so important. I, I actually after I've seen her the first time, make sure it's not a yeast infection or one of the other things, I say, bring your partner in and let's go over a plan so you know we're going from A to B, B to C, what you can expect, how long it's gonna take, I don't have an instant pill and snap my fingers, it's gonna be gone, and make sure he understands. And I've said this before that a lot of times men need a gynecologist because they don't understand and a gynecologist can explain it to them. What's going on with my partner or my wife? And they don't understand and we can explain it to them. And they can be very supportive, but giving the woman back control. Yes. And that's where the dilators come in and using whatever uh, cream or, or emollient or hormones that is, is most appropriate. But if, if there's even surgery that's been done and it's extensive bloody surgery it's not pretty Ugh. okay um, let's talk a little bit about shame I'm sure a lot of women feel shame when this happens to her body um, and I don't think any anybody should ever feel shame when something changes um, can you speak on this a little bit and wh what should she do to well, you know, I think you make a good point because very often women will say that their bodies are betraying them and they really, and it's not about their partner and they really want to be intimate, but they don't really understand. So again, I think for me, um, the best way to combat any of these issues with shame or depression is knowledge is power, really, and really get good information um, and good information is not always Dr. Google or the Dr. Internet or what have you. It's really go to good resources like we have at the Patty Brisbane Foundation and different organizations. Get facts over fiction. Be empowered about knowledge and understand that there's a timeline to develop. Set realistic expectations. So again, understand that this condition does happen. Sometimes, uh, very often we talk about shame and people uh, self-blame about these conditions and there's nothing that they have done or right or wrong or it's not a punishment or what have you it's just a medical condition that has happened um, so again for me knowledge is power being educated um, and and really don't suffer in silence and we talk about empowerment for women and that's one of our goals for the patty brisbane foundation is empowerment through research empowerment through knowledge and I think that's the best way to elevate women to understand that this is a condition that's happened this is a condition I'm going to become powerful over and I'm going to take back control 
There you go. And they've been told nothing's wrong with them by so many other doctors, and they start to feel angry as more than even shame that I see, and they just want to be fixed. And once they realize it's a medical condition, not in their head, they're more empowered, and we have a plan, and we know we're going to go from A to Z through that plan. Yeah, other than being told to drink some wine and exactly. to get and yourself to relax a, yeah, relax. That's right. All those things that could bring shame on by you might try that. She might try that and there's there's nothing happening. They've been blown off by doctors before who do, This does take time. It's it's not a, a mm -hmm. quick thing and we have doctors that have babies in labor and they have a, a reception area full of patients and they, I don't want to deal with this. Well, don't. Send it to somebody that will take the time. I don't deal that. with it. That's right. Right. And referral is never a failure for a clinician. And again, going back to what we talked about full circle, build your team. Because I think yes. that doctors would be, I would think that if a doctor said, hey, this is, I, I want to send you to this person, I would be so grateful to that doctor that sent me than if he tried to just blow me off and say, right. I, well, you'll but, be angry. Yeah, I would yeah. be angry. But, but you also have to realize that there's a lot of clinicians out there that ascribe to, you know, if I'm referring to somebody, it's really a reflection on my shortcomings. And I always say arrogance and ignorance is a bad combination. Yes. Referral is never a failure. Referral is actually a victory and really recognizing your limitations as a clinician and again we talk about this all the time in the podcast if you go to a clinician as a woman and your needs are not being met look at your healthcare team and decide and it may be time to fire them it's also the fact that if you say i hear what you're saying dr london i'd like a second opinion and if that doctor starts becoming uncomfortable about you wanting more information or a second opinion, that should be maybe a little, a bit of a red flag. Wrong doctor. Right. There you go. Dr. London, would you like to add anything else about vulvodynia that you feel that might have been missed here today? It's just underappreciated, underdiagnosed, and treated for so many other things. And having a, a team and a plan, and the, the thing is a plan, mm -hmm. and that's, that's the key. And you will, you will give the woman control and she's not had it before. I, I agree. I want to thank my guests, Dr. Michael Critchman and Dr. Andrew London, for a great conversation. And if you like what you heard today, please rate and subscribe to our podcast. For more information on the Patty Brisbane Foundation for Women's Sex Sexual Health and our focused areas, visit thepattybrisbanefoundation.org. Remember, sex care, is self-care and sexual health matters.